Hello, everybody, and welcome to our weekly Facebook live stream. My name is Abigail Richardson Schulte, and I am composer in residence with the HPO. Now, today we have a very special version of Get to Know the HPO. It is our history edition, and we will be speaking with Megan Norse, one of our staff members. But before we do, I'd like to invite you, if you have any interesting HPO things that you've gathered from over the years, to take a picture and post it here. I have this uh, wonderful Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra glass. And uh, we also have a, a photo here of our former executive director wearing that beautiful HPO sweatshirt. I actually found that at uh, Vintage Soul Geek uh, on King Street and, and called her and said, look what I just found. And she said, buy it, I want it. Um, so uh, this, is, this is really quite fun. So please uh, post some pictures and feel free to share uh, your stories with us as well. So now we have Megan with us. She is a communications and outreach assistant with the HPO. Welcome, Megan. Hi, Abby. <laughs> so uh, tell us, what were you hired to do at the HPO? Well, um, so it was just about a year ago, actually, that this happened. I feel like I kind of won the job lottery a little bit. Um, I was hired to dive through uh, bins and pins of HBO archive materials that had been saved by the organization, that had been donated by patrons and board members and volunteers over the years, um, and was all just kind of sitting in the back storage room. And um, everyone was trying to figure out, what do we do with this? How do we tell our story? What do we, how do you archive things? Um, are these okay in bins? Should we wear gloves? You know, things like that. Um, so I was kind of hired to figure out what to do with that and how to tell our story. So we're partnering with the um, Hamilton Public Library and their local history and archive department who have been phenomenal to work with. Um, shout out to Karen, the manager over there. She's wonderful and responded well to many of my hysteric emails last summer. Um, so they are helping us archive everything. So we we went through last summer, I spent weeks and weeks digging through old programs and photographs, um, taking images and digitizing things and share them with our audience. And then we um, handed it all over to the library and their archive department is phenomenal. They um, kind of take care of everything from there. So it was a donation on our part to them and they will archive and catalog everything and eventually make it available for public viewing. And that's really exciting. It's, um, and that will be, then our history is protected with them and we can continue to add to that archive over the year. And it's really special. And I think we're really lucky to be working with them. So this event will be available at the downtown branch? Yeah, so there is actually, um, unfortunately, uh, they are not open right now, but, um, if you go onto the third floor of the library in the local history and archives department, you can already see HPO things that have been donated over the years, um, things that people from their personal collections may have sent straight to the library. Um, and yes, eventually the things that were once in bins in the back of our office will be on display and cataloged and, and yeah, it's gonna be a really great mm -hmm. resource. Great, so let's dive into the history. When did the HPO start? Well, that's, that's a long story, Abigail, um, and I've been waiting to tell it. <laughs> um, so our history, orchestral music has been a big part of Hamilton for centuries. Um, and our history specifically traces back to 1984, to what was in some records known as the Hamilton Orchestral Society. Others called it the Hamilton Philharmonic Society. Those words are interchangeable. We're talking 1884, um, right? 1884, yeah. 1884. So that was found uh, formed by a man named J.E.P. Aldis, who was uh, a local concert master at a church, um, which is where most of our early music directors came from. They were the big shot choir master organist who was new in town and decided to take up the orchestra, um, which it's funny. Um, but yeah, so he got things started back in 1884. We had an orchestra and a choir, and that continued. It changed hands a few times. Um, in 1887, a man by the name of C.L.M. Harris became music director, 
and he changed the name to the Harris Orchestral Club, which is bold. Um, but so, you know, I respect that kind of, um, but eventually it got, it went back, it went back to the Hamilton um, Orchestral Society. And uh, by the turn of the century, it was being called the Hamilton Symphony Orchestra. So it went through many different iterations. In all of these, it was a community volunteer-based orchestra. Um, and with the goal of just bringing, bringing live music to the community. And so, yeah, that there wasn't necessarily the consistency that we have now. There wasn't a straight, you know, September to um, May season, but the orchestra was there and it had a very strong presence. And I think the amount of times it was revived after, um, you know, it would go away for a few years really shows how much our community wanted it. I, I so, find it interesting at this point that uh, the the proceeds from this orchestra, uh, like in the 1890s, were going to charity. Now now we we take charity. We we are the ones that need the donations. But at this point, they yes. were giving it away. Where were they giving it to? Um, yeah, that's really interesting. So um, the uh, early yes, early HPO was donating proceeds to charity. So it went to some places like the Hamilton Girls Club, um, but a really significant one was that proceeds went to start the music department at the Hamilton Public Library, which had already existed wow. before we were around. Um, so that's, I mean, an amazing part of legacy to have contributed to because um, we know Hamilton is a music city and the Hamilton Public Library has been a huge, huge part of making music um, a big part of our city and culture. So to have had a small part in starting that original library department is pretty cool. That's great. And, and we're still such a big part of it um, with our performances and presentations at the library. So it's nice to know it goes that far back. Wow. Yeah, yes, we have been friends for a long time. <laughs> Now, um, I understand, I mean, in those early days, we had uh, turnover of a quite a, quite a lot of artistic directors. People would mm -hmm. come in for a few years or even a year. Um, and, and that was really pretty common, I think, in the day. It was also really common for orchestras to fold. Um, looking through the Encyclopedia of Music in Canada, you know, I can see that, um, well, for one thing, uh, the HPO isn't listed as being formed until 1949, that all of these early days are, are just negated because it wasn't professional. Um, and, uh, but along the way in Canada, so many orchestras folded. They just, they, and, and one would fold and another would pop up right away. Mm -hmm. um, now I understand uh, this orchestra folded in the 1920s, was it? Yeah, so in 1926, um, what at the time was the Hamilton Symphony Orchestra folded. And then um, that had been a little post, there was lulls around the wars. So World War I kind of put an end to the orchestra life in Hamilton. Um, and it came back for a couple of years after um, until 1931 when Graham Godfrey revived, revived the HSO. So he moved here to Hamilton from England where he had studied music and he moved here to be, um, to be a, a choir master at a local church. And he really took the symphony in Hamilton to the next level of what it had been. He made something much more sustainable. Um, and he also formed the Bach Choir, which later merged with the existing Elgar Choir and is now the Bach Elgar Choir, who um, uh. we know are friends. So on the screen here, you can actually see an old uh, photo of Graham Godfrey's orchestra. This one's from 1932. I believe it's in uh, Knox Presbyterian Church, um, which is pretty exciting. We've got another one that's 1936 um, that I think is at Memorial, outside of Memorial School, where we performed a lot. Um, and these were donated actually just at the beginning of this season, so past September, um, by a patron who I believe her mother or her grandmother was in the choir, and she found them in her attic and donated them to us, which was very kind and wonderful of her. Those are great pictures, and uh, you know Hamilton. Uh, we say it's a music city, but it's very much a choral city. There are so many really strong choirs and, and it's nice to see that that history goes back uh, that far as well. Yeah, mm -hmm. so uh, you mentioned that uh, the orchestra didn't last through World War I. That was actually common uh, across the country. There's only one orchestra in Canada that lasted through World War I and that is the uh, Quebec Symphony Orchestra. 
the rest folded. Wow. Um, now uh, it, it picked up again. Uh, what what happened during World War II? Was it active? No, so we were not active during World War II. That's kind of at the start of World War II is when Godfrey's orchestra um, kind of folded and uh, disappeared, and as did the choirs at the time. And then it was post-World War II in 1949 that musicians who had been in um, Godfrey's orchestra in the 30s, they decided they wanted to like make a real go out of it and make a professional orchestra for this community that was going to last for years to come. And so that is when in 1949, um, we were officially founded as the Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra. And that was under the artistic direction of Jan Wallenek, who had just the year before helped found the St. Catherine Civic Orchestra, which is now the Niagara Symphony. I see. And, uh, and so at this point now we are legitimate. <laughs> we have been informed. Um, where were the concerts happening? Um, early concerts were kind of happening wherever you could find space. <laughs> so our very first rehearsal in uh, September of 1949, the first rehearsal took place at the CKOC radio station in Hamilton. And then our first concert was at the Hamilton Forum, which was uh, also known as the Barton Street Arena, um, which I do not believe is standing anymore. So those were like the very early days. And then we were jumping around um, from school auditoriums. So there was Memorial School, which is at Maine and Ottawa. Um, we performed in their auditorium throughout the 50s before we moved to the Westdale Auditorium and then performed there for almost another decade. Um, and then, yeah, continue to jump around. So then we moved to the Palace Theater, which was uh, downtown Hamilton, no longer standing. Right now, that, um, I think that was a really huge one that burned to the ground, right? Yes. Hmm. Yeah, the Palace Theater, I think, was uh, was quite a big deal in its heyday. Um, and it served as well for a few years, but it, I think it was a little too small for the orchestra to keep growing. So that was when we were at the Palace was when the conversations about getting our own concert hall or the city getting its own concert hall really started to happen. Um, but we still had a few years to wait. So there was a couple of years of performing at the Mohawk College Theater before finally in 1973, Hamilton Place opened and the HPO finally had a home. <laughs> Right. Now, uh, let's talk about the HPO in the 60s, because the 60s are really where it, it all, everything started moving, right, on a major yes. scale. Can you tell us about that? Um, yes. So the 60s started out with um, our music director at the time, Victor DiBello, who I think we have a photo of, of him with our longtime patrons, um, Marnie and Larry Pagan. This, I think, might have been right, 1959 or 1960. Um, so he started to bring the orchestra um, a little more out into the community. He was teaching a music appreciation class at the local YMCA, which is what this photo is from, and started to raise the profile a little bit. And so then after him in 1962, um, the conductor Lee Hefner became our music director, and he continue to just make strides. Um, he taught at Mohawk, he was uh, a big figure in Hamilton and he did a lot to grow the orchestra. You know, we started we started uh, the 60s with an operating budget around like $20,000 and by the end of the 60s, the operating budget had more than tripled. And that's pretty incredible growth for just one decade. Mm -hmm. yeah, it's the it's like the thing of pictures. Uh, so uh, Victor DiBello, I understand, was uh, the first to start actual real auditions with the orchestra. So as it became professional, of course, then uh, he, he raised the standard. Um, mm -hmm. I'm also excited to see that he was teaching music appreciation classes um, because that's something that uh, a, a lot of what I do now for the orchestra. And I'm so pleased to see that. Um, mm -hmm. And then of course, it's so nice to see uh, Larry and Marnie Pakin there. Uh, they've been such uh, tremendous contributors to the HPO uh, as, yeah. uh, as board members, as chairs, of the board um, and uh, they're still very much involved with us. Yeah. Yeah, it's kind of incredible. They've both been um, very wonderful to me and helpful during this project um, as very good fact checkers. <laughs> um, 
but yeah, so they Larry Mar- Larry Pagan has been involved with the HBO for almost his whole life. I think he started attending concerts as a child. Um, but him and Marnie as adults, they they took this music appreciation class um, that led to Larry being tapped to join the board of directors, and he became president. And he was kind of like the young, fresh voice on uh, an orchestra board at the time. Um, and Marnie was on the women's committee. She, um, I believe, was the editor of the Philharmonic Notes, which was the women's committee newsletter. Yeah. Um, yeah, I've got a whole stack of those that are just fascinating to look through. <laughs> um, but yeah, so they and they are still uh, very much involved. They attend so many concerts there. Um, I believe they're watching right now. I hope they're watching right now. Um, and it's it's incredible to see um, that kind of lifetime commitment to an organization and what they've they've been able to do. You know, Marnie, she became president of our board in the late 60s. She's pretty incredible. Uh, I would recommend Googling her if you have not, because <laughs> um, she's a really wonderful person and has done some amazing things in this community and beyond. Um, and yeah, she was on the committee that hired our longtime music director, Boris Brat, who became a very celebrated Hamiltonian. Uh, she worked with our first executive director, Betty Webster, who's another big person in the 60s who just did so much for this organization and other orchestras. So yeah, we had some really great people. <laughs> mm-hmm. uh, we have a comment here from Pat Dickinson who says, I remember Lee conducting at Mohawk Auditorium. That's great. And uh, for those of you watching, I'm sure many of you would know that uh, Lee Hepner uh, was uh, Darcy Hepner's father. And uh, it, on our concert stages um, for the last few years, we have had Darcy Hepner putting together our Beatles show. So he's mm-hmm. still in the community and Darcy is at Mohawk College. So that's that's a nice tie-in. Um, now, uh, Betty Betty Webster, you mentioned Betty Webster, and um, mm-hmm. uh, the Pakins were very involved with her at that point. Uh, there's a great picture of her. Um, mm-hmm. Can you tell us uh, a little bit about really what, what Betty did to help make the orchestra uh, professional? Yeah, so Betty Webster, um, she took some advice from the Ontario Arts Council on how to make the orchestra fully professional with everybody on a salary, which wasn't happening before that um, because it wasn't affordable. So she found a way with this advice from the Arts Council to make it affordable and work together with Marnie Pakin and with Boris Broad and others at the time to um, launch programs that allowed us to sustain a professional orchestra. So she took over as executive director in 1967. She was our very first and um, was, yeah, really the catalyst behind behind what happened in the decades to follow. Um, she created a program where we were partnering with the uh, Hamilton School Board and doing performances in schools. We were also partner- partnering with McMaster University to teach classes in their music department. And so that allowed the organization to sustain a full-time salaried orchestra and allowed for us to expand into the community, reach people we never would have reached before, and expand artistically um, a great deal. Hmm. And uh, just a a, a follow-up here from online, Pat also mentions, and Lee's wife, Darcy's mom, Pat Rolston, started the Mohawk College Choir. Uh, I think, yeah, she was very involved in, in setting up that Mohawk music program. Um, yes. And uh, many people would know the Ralston family, like Shauna Ralston, uh, fabulous Canadian cellist, um, and uh, the Ralston set up the Banff Center. So it's it's a really interesting family. Um, and uh, and then also uh, Betty Webster um, was Ardeth Brott's mother, right? And then we go into the next uh, phase. We'll talk about a little bit later when Boris Brott comes into the picture. But before we do, Megan, you, maybe you can just tell us a little bit about the women's committee because they were very active and a very important part of, of our history. Yeah, so um, this was the thing I learned that I, I didn't really know is that uh, women's committees are kind of what made arts organizations happen in the 20th century. (laughs) Um, They were behind the scenes doing the work like fundraising and promotion. Um, 
the Women's Committee for the HPO was founded on the exact same day that the organization was founded in 1949 because of the need was immediately clear. Um, you know, at the time they didn't have an administrative staff like we had now. So there was a volunteer committee of women because of the time it was in, um, who did a significant amount of the work to make the HPO known and to make it um, financially successful. So, and there's a story um, I would recommend, I'm sure it's gonna be posted in the comments, um, but we have a, a brief history of our women's committee uh, on the HPO website that I would really encourage people to read because it's it's amazing and some really great people came out of it. And another thing they did is uh, start the Philharmonic Children of Hamilton. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. So this is actually the um, centennial project of the Women's Committee. So in 1967, um, which by that time, the Women's Committee was commit contributing at least a quarter of the annual budget to the orchestra through their fundraising. Um, so they were already doing a lot. And then they decided they needed to do even more <laughs> and started the first Suzuki school in Hamilton um, for uh, young children to learn string instruments. And um, it was completely separate from the HPO. It was kind of created, they created it through fundraising and then made it its own organization that was kind of like a gift to the city almost, I would say. Um, and uh, Marta Hitty was named artistic director for many years and she was at the time the concert master of the HPO. Yeah, that's a, a beautiful picture of, of her there. So um, many of you might know that, uh, well, I'm married to Michael Schulte, a violinist, and Michael was a, a longtime student of Marta Hitty's. Um, uh, started studying with her when he was a teenager and uh, he, she was a, a really important mentor to her, uh, to him. And we have a lot of uh, her, her things. Um, she left him her bow. Uh, this is really amazing early Swanhead Picot bow, um, and a lot of her music. Um, so uh, I'm just going to turn around here and. Uh, pull out, we have a lot of her music, we're actually drowning in her music and a lot of it is really interesting, uh, you know, Hungarian pieces written for her with dedications. But we have all of these uh, Suzuki books. Um, these are the, those are her original Suzuki books and they're, oh, wow. uh, they're, they're all, all uh, you know, Japanese. Um, this was really before they were uh, really common here and, and printed. Um, but it's, these are filled with uh, her notes. You know, you can see that, uh, she is uh, she is teaching these students and um, and was really such a great impact um, on uh, for for teaching small children and the Suzuki method. Um, so yeah, that that's really amazing. Um, Megan, do you want to tell us a little bit more about Marta Hitty from your perspective, and then uh, I'll share a story and jump in as well. Yeah. So as you mentioned, she's from Hungary and she began her career there um, and was very successful before she moved to Canada. She became the concert master of the HPO in 1966 and she stayed there until 1974. Um, and while at the same time was teaching music at McMaster, participating in our education programs, um, she came from a very musical family, so her son John actually played cello in the HPO, and her daughter Marta was in the HPYO, and I believe her husband also, her husband, yeah, Antel Dvorak, he played double bass uh, briefly in the HPO as well, so for a while it was a family affair. <laughs> and, and I'll just <laughs> jump in there and say that uh, Dvorak is the same family as Antonin Dvorak, He's, uh, her husband yeah. is a direct descendant of Dvorak. Yes, which I think probably gets you some clout in the classical music world. Um, uh, but yeah, she uh, had a really incredible um, impact on the HBO and on the community in Hamilton. She taught a lot of students. You know, the, the image that's on the screen now, we posted that on our social media maybe about a month or two ago, and we got such a positive response from some of her former students who had loved her and had great stories to share. Um, and she was also, uh, she eventually under Boris Brat became the assistant conductor and was the first female in Canada to hold that position. 
Mm -hmm. Now, uh, as you mentioned, she had a, a tremendous career in Hungary. Uh, she was Hungarian national soloist and uh, was set off on these grand tours. And at, at a certain point, she was performing up to eight Beethoven concertos a week. That's just staggering. So she had this massive career. Um, and then uh, with the Hungarian Revolution in 1956, her family left and uh, they ended up in Winnipeg. And would you believe she ended up working at a broom factory um, and then became concert master of the Winnipeg Symphony and then was brought to Hamilton um, to teach at McMaster and, and be the concert master of the HPO. So it's really quite an, an incredible history. Um, mm -hmm. Now, um, I, uh, I met her a number of times. The, the last time was very, very special. Um, so another thing about uh, Marta is she created ensembles. She created the ensemble Sir Ernest Macmillan. Uh, later she was playing, uh, she started an ensemble Marta Heady and Friends. And that's when Michael, my husband, uh, joined as a young professional. Uh, he was the youngest and the rest of them were quite a lot older, but you know, really fantastic, fantastic chamber musicians. Um, and uh, this, was, uh, this was a very special time for Michael. And uh, Marta Hidi was not one to give a lot of compliments, um, but uh, a few days before she died, she pulled in a lot of people uh, close to her at her house and invited Michael and I was there too. And she said she wanted to make an announcement and she shared that uh, Michael was the best chamber musician on violin she had ever played with. So wow. this, was, this was very, very special. And then of course she left him her entire collection of music as well. Um, and, and as I mentioned, wow. he has her bow. So um, I, uh, this is, this is uh, very special and, and personal and it's, it's really uh, so great to see people appreciating her and uh, everything she did for this city. Mm -hmm. And uh, especially being um, a, a conductor, a female conductor. And now, of course, we have a female conductor at the HPO. So it's, it's really, uh, really wonderful to see. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so uh, we've been talking about uh, HPO and, and the great work with, with kids that were happening. Um, where was the HPYO in all of this? When did that come in? That, that's a great question. Um, yeah, so the HPYO was founded by Glenn Mallory um, in the uh, mid 1960s, I think it was 1965, um, who was, he was working for the Hamilton School Board at the time, um, I believe running their music department. And he was a friend of Lee Heppner's. He was um, occasionally uh, playing percussion in the orchestra when he needed a, an extra body. And um, yeah, I mean, he was very passionate about uh, young people having the space to make music in Hamilton and saw the need for a youth orchestra, something to aspire to, something to, um, you know, get kids involved to make them see that the Hamilton Philharmonic Orchestra was a place that they could get to and they could work to. Um, and he put his whole heart and his whole life into the HPYO. And I think anyone who knew him would share that as well. Um, he was the uh, director for decades um, until, yeah, there's only been two music directors, I believe, of the HPYO, and he held the spot for a good 40 years. <laughs> um, but he was just a phenomenal, a phenomenal educator and deeply, deeply dedicated to this community and to young musicians. Um, I think one of the most interesting things that I read about the HPYO in going through their history was this trip they took to um, Muthany in 1971, um, which just kind of blows my mind. Um, Glenn Mallory taking a bunch of teenagers on a 12, 13 hour bus ride. Um, and then they also had to like, uh, I don't know, like ski or sled or something across like uh, an ice road. It was quite the adventure to take a large ensemble of children on. And I, I really commend him for it because I think he probably changed a lot of people's lives. Um, I would imagine that would have been a very special experience. Uh, the orchestra visited um, some Cree Nation reserves, uh, places that are so remote and at the time were not experiencing that type of live music being performed. And um, many of the kids living there 
hadn't been exposed to those instruments. And so, yeah, it's a really special story kind of to look back on and think um, that he was willing to do that and then stayed with the orchestra for another 30 years. Um, so yeah, he's just one of those people like, like Marta, like Betty and a bunch of other people from our history who just was passionate and put in the work and didn't let anybody tell him no. Um, and then made something really incredible that's still here. The HPYO is still active. It's still a great organization. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty awesome. Yeah, that's great. And, and it's uh, so nice to have them on stage every year at our holiday event. And and uh, more and more, the two organizations are connected. So that that's nice to see. Um, online, we had a lovely comment from Lynn, who remembers uh, seeing Lee Hepner conduct and remembers meeting uh, Marta Hitty and, and seeing Glenn Mallory. So uh, thanks for that, Lynn. That That's really nice. And now let's get on to the next phase of the HPO, the 70s. And this mm -hmm. was when... Boris Brock came on. Now I have heard um, through the grapevine that when he got the job, there were some billboards around Hamilton and they were white billboards with black lettering. And the only lettering was Boris is coming. <laughs> so can you tell us uh, about uh, how he, he uh, started the job here and some things he did? Yeah. And you know what, that is a great it's a great mental image that really speaks to what I've seen in our history. Um, you know, in the sixties, the foundation was laid to expand the orchestra artistically. And he came in in 1969 and just hit the ground running. Um, you know, he was known as the mod maestro. Um, and it's, it's funny, you know, I look at these uh, old promotional materials and interviews and spec articles about him. Um, he was this 25 year old celebrity in Hamilton. It's, and he was the leader of an orchestra. It's kind of amazing. Um, and continued to expand the HBO, you know, for a long time, the HBO was, the HBO and Boris Brought were really, um, went hand in hand and uh, yeah. And he did, he did a lot to expand our image and he was really focused on getting us into the community. Um, a lot of people might remember having heard about this in 1973, he arranged for a performance on the DeFasco factory floor, which is pretty cool. Um, and then late, a few years later in 1975, um, the HPO performed at Ennis Pakin's Field. So it was really the beginning of this uh, love affair between music and steel in Hamilton that has continued. Um, and yeah, he, he just really changed the face of orchestral music in Hamilton and made it cool. He made it something people were interested in. Yeah, oh, that's a great picture there with uh, some of the workers sitting on wood watching, uh, you yeah. know, and, and now we, uh, <laughs> As, as we try to reinvent orchestral music, we're, you know, trying to get into different spaces and perform. And yet, you know, here it was done in 1975. <laughs> yeah. Yes. Um, it was a lot easier to get on a factory floor in 1975 than it is now. Right. Right. Yeah. None of those uh, safety uh, requirements. <laughs> yeah. um, now, uh, I find it very interesting that in the early 70s, the orchestra brought in these existing uh phenomenal uh chamber music groups um mm -hmm. like uh the, the like the czech quartet um and canadian brass uh that started yeah. here and also the the saint paul woodwind quintet uh, do, do you want to talk about that and and what they did for the community as well yeah so that um is another example of um Boris and Betty Webster really working well together to carry out a plan. Um, they were trying to make the HPO profitable and professional. So they brought in these existing ensembles um, and then they sent them out to the community. Um, we had the Canadian Brass, which formed in our brass section and the St. Paul Woodwind Quintet and the Czech String Quartet, as you mentioned. Um, they performed in the orchestra, but they also were a big part of our education program. They played in probably every school within driving distance of Hamilton and um, really expanded uh, our reach and expanded our community and also brought some incredible music to Hamilton and the world because people like the Canadian Brass have gone on to just have an international career that is still going, um, which is kind of amazing. 
Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> now, um, at this point too, we started to have concerts specifically for children, correct? Yes, yes. So that was another part of the expanding the education program was um, getting family audiences, um, getting to young children and teaching them about classical music from an early age. So, and we had some help from a local celebrity named Martin Short. He narrated several of our family concerts in the 70s. I think this was very early in his career, <laughs> but still it's really exciting. It's cool to see that someone again, who went on to have this international career, um, got their start on the stage at Hamilton Place with our orchestra performing for kids. Um, so yeah. Yeah, with, with Marty Short there. Yeah. yeah. And I, I read that uh, his mother was actually a concert master of the HPO before it was professional. Yes, um, that is, that's a tidbit I did miss in my uh, early history. Um, Olive Short, who is the mother of Martin Short, she was the very first concert master of an orchestra in North America. And she was named um, that for the HPO in, I believe, 1955. That's great. Uh, now, going into the 70s, isn't that when the concert hall was built? Yes, so 1973 um, was when Hamilton Place officially opened. So there were some delays, that's why in the very early 70s, we were still performing at the Mohawk College Theater while we very eagerly awaited um, Hamilton Place to open. This is a, a drawing from the architect who was Trevor Garwood Jones, another celebrated Hamiltonian. Um, and yeah, so it, it opened in 1973. Um, this was the festival that inaugurated the building. It was a 30 night long, the HPO um, performed. And I think it was a pretty spectacular month if I, uh, based on, the, the lineup that was there. Um, but yeah, what I think is really interesting about Hamilton Place and what has been probably the most interesting part about this project is seeing how much our community wanted it and how much work was put in to making it a reality and how long it took for that reality to happen. Um, you know, planning began in the early 1960s, so a decade before it actually opened with just a small group of people in the community who knew that um, Hamilton needed an arts, they needed a performing arts place, they needed a concert hall. Um, so yeah, so the, uh, the Hamilton Theater Auditorium Foundation was then formed and raised the funds to, um, to create the building. So at the time, another, um, kind of competing arts project was the National Arts Center in Ottawa. And that had um, federal and provincial funding really preoccupied and it wasn't available for Hamilton Place. Um, so the funding all had to come locally. And in the end, over 15,000 people ended up contributing um, to have the concert hall built, which is incredible. And um, a really special part of that is that DeFasco employees actually contributed 23 more than $23,000 to the project, which was done through payroll deductions. And that was the first time that that method of fundraising through payroll deductions had happened for an arts organization in North America. So it's pretty cool. That's incredible that it came to payroll deductions. Wow, I, uh, I wonder if everyone was on board. They, they didn't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> That's the thing is, I think it, it really it came from the employees. You know, their um, that ad that was just on screen. We have some really stunning um, DeFasco ads in our old programs, demonstrating how much their uh, steelworkers wanted this concert hall. They didn't want that stereotype that we were a lunch pail town. They wanted people to know that they supported the arts and culture, and they knew it was just as important as the steel industry. That's brilliant. Amazing. Uh, we have a nice comment here from Elaine, who uh, remembers the Sunday Kids Symphonies and brought her two kids from Burlington and loved those days. Uh, we do still have family programming, and we're doing those at uh, the Mohawk Theater, um, mm -hmm. although that's obviously postponed for now. Um, so, Megan, can you tell us about now the 1980s? Yeah, so things 
changed slowly in the 80s. Um, one of the big changes for the HPO in the 80s was that the Women's Committee opened their membership to all genders and changed their name to the HPO Guild. So they were uh, an incorporated organization separate from the HPO that worked to raise funds and awareness about the orchestra. And um, two people who were very heavily involved in the guild are Alan and Marlies Clark, who are still very active HPO patrons. Um, and they were, they were kind of like the stars of the volunteer show in the 80s, I think. Um, they, lived, they lived right next door to the RBG and they hosted countless um, fundraisers for the HPO there. Um, we have stories of Marley's furiously chopping up vegetables and cheese for plates and, you know, carting cases of wine over there on a sled on a snowy day. Um, and this image that is on the screen now is of the decorator showcase in 1982, which was um, something Marley's was very heavily involved in planning. Um, it was a dream home tour at the time. So a new development company was building a new community in Waterdown, and they had built this state-of-the-art uh, dream home, which in 1982 meant that it had a microwave, <laughs> and <laughs> they let people tour it. They uh, donated, the uh, owners of the home allowed the HPO to hold, hold tours, and there were things like craft shows and um, microwave oven demonstrations. That was one of the events. <laughs> um, performances and yeah and Marlies Clark was a huge driver behind that project and it was one of the most successful fundraisers of that decade for us. It's fascinating to talk to Marlies about these times she has a lot of stories about about this time and and it really makes me realize how important these volunteers have been to the HPO over the years they've really sustained it so uh, we just yeah wow we're so grateful for their contribution. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, what else was uh, was happening at this time? Wasn't there a TV show or something? Oh, yes, there was. <laughs> um, so a very interesting piece of tidbit. This was short lived. Um, Hamilton Place was the location of filming for the Palace TV show, which was a TV variety show um, hosted by someone named Jack Jones, who some might be familiar with, um, who was a bit of a Johnny Carson type. And the HBO was like the resident orchestra. We were um, performing at every show. And this was broadcast all across the United States and Canada and had some really incredible guests like Aretha Franklin and um, Donny Osmond and many other names. Like there were some really big names that were right on the Hamilton Place stage, just like a few feet in front of the orchestra. Um, and that's a really special thing to be part of. And if you ever have a chance to have a conversation with our longtime timpanist, Jean Norman, um, he would love to tell you about his TV days, as he has told me a few stories. Um, so yeah, it's, it's a cool, a cool, quirky, little weird blip in our history that um, there's not a lot of information about it out there. Like most of what I know about it, I learned from talking to Jean Norman. Um, but just very cool, very interesting thing that we got to be a part of. Wow, it would be great to see those, track them yeah. down somehow. Yeah. They um, must be out there. <laughs> yeah. Now, um, at, at this point, uh, somewhere along the way, there was a, a conductor evaluation form uh, floating around. Isn't it, that's, that's from the 80s, I think? Ah, there yeah, it is, yes. 1984. Yeah, I was wondering, uh, I wonder what some of our current musicians would we would pass that around and see if they would want to fill it out. Um, yeah, it's now, interesting times. Yeah, um, yeah, conductor evaluation forms like this are actually quite important for uh, guest conductors, right? They, mm. These sorts of things typically aren't done with with the music director. They're definitely not. Um, but it's a chance for musicians to uh, give feedback on the guest conductors and see if they would like to have them back again. So these uh, these days would be done electronically or would be done through um, an advisory committee to get feedback from musicians. But, but this certainly happens uh, in professional orchestras. So it's uh, interesting to see that coming from 1984. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. Now, um, the uh, Boris Brot's time with the orchestra uh, finished moving into the 90s, correct? So what happened yeah. then at the beginning of the 90s? So at the beginning of the 90s, we were led by uh, Victor Feldbrill, um, who I believe we have, might have a photo of. He was our music director between 1990 and 93. And then after him came Akira Endo, who stayed until 1996. So um, I would say about our 90s presence, our branding got very 90s. And um, we have some concert, oh, there's Victor. <laughs> uh, and um, yeah, things, that image that you showed at the beginning of, uh, there we go. <laughs> there's a, a very good 90s um, program cover. And um, the uh, sweatshirt that uh, Diana Weir was wearing at the beginning in the photo you showed, the um, logo on that sweatshirt was from uh, the HPO in the early 90s. And this is a picture of a, a Gershwin recording that That's we did great. in 1992. Yeah. Yeah. Um, just a note here from um, Melanie Ayers, who is our, our second bassoonist here says uh, the wording on the conductor evaluation form hasn't changed. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> if it's not broken, don't fix it. Right. All right. So um, the the HPO's uh, the HPO's difficult time here uh, in folding. Uh, wh when did that happen? What what year yeah. and, and how long was it down for? So the orchestra folded in 1996. Um, it came unexpectedly to the community and it was a hard hit, I think, for our community. But we came back very quickly. Um, by the spring of 1997, HBO musicians were hosting um, events at, hosting small concerts at the Scottish Rite uh, in downtown Hamilton. And then by the start of the 1997-98 season, the new Hamilton Orchestra had been incorporated, which was comprised of our former musicians. And um, that, was, that orchestra was created by community members who knew that we needed to have an orchestra and that if we let the HPO go away forever, um, it would be a huge detriment to the community. So we had people in the community like Gordon Bullock, and Sam Taylor and um, our longtime HPO cellist who's just recently retired, Marsha Moffat, who were very active in getting the funds and the community support together to restart the orchestra, which for a few years was known as the new Hamilton Orchestra. Um, and then by the end of the 90s, uh, we were just back to being the HPO again. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, this pretty much wraps up our history, right? Then we're we're coming into current history. So uh, tell me, who were the music directors um, that that took over uh, after the orchestra had folded? Yeah, so there was um, Mario Bern Bernardi, I believe, and there was Michael Reason. They were in the early two thousands. And then we come into the current area and we had Jamie Somerville who um, was, had a huge impact on the HPO, um, has been mentioned I think in every single one of these live streams now. <laughs> um, and then Gemma New who is still with us and is amazing. Yeah. So. Yeah, well, thank you so much, Megan. This, is, this has been fascinating. Uh, if any of you have any questions, now is your chance uh, to, uh, to ask them. Um, in the meantime, Megan, I just have one question for you. What is, what is your background? What has prepared you for doing all of this research and writing? Um, it's a bit of hodgepodge. Um, my background is mostly in journalism. So I got my start at a, a student newspaper in university and worked for a few different publications. And that's where I really found my love of storytelling. Most recently, I worked for this phenomenal newspaper in Kitchener-Waterloo. It's called The Community Edition. And when I worked there, I had the opportunity to explore human interest stories um, and finding the fascinating things about regular life. And I loved it. So then I decided I wanted to do more of that. So I left journalism and I, I found the opportunity where I could do more storytelling. And I feel pretty lucky to be here.
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. You're, you're still in journalism, it sounds like it, for the HBO. Um, we, it looks like we don't have any questions, but we have a, a very nice comment from Heather Beal, who is one of our board members. She says, Megan, this has been fantastic. I love the photos, clippings, and especially the stories. Oral history really connects us to the people that have been involved and continue to be involved to see the success of our HBO. Oh, and then something from uh, Larry Pakin, who's watching. Yay, Larry Pakin, one of our, our very important people over the years, says uh, Mario Bernardi don donated his conducting services to the new orchestra. Oh, isn't that amazing? That's wow. that's, that's amazing. Um, I, I find it very interesting to see uh, conductor, uh, sorry, orchestras that have, have fallen and then get picked by up, picked back up by their musicians, like like London, uh, that's a, a more recent example. And, and all of the uh, tremendous effort people put into this, uh, including working for, for no pay. So uh, that's, that's really incredible. Um, oh, and we have a comment here from Lennox, who is, uh, uh, it works in development for the HPO. Um, congratulations to both Abby and Megan for your nominations for the Hamilton Arts Awards. Can you tell us about that? Um, Great. Well, thank, thanks, Lennox. Um, yeah, so uh, from my point of view, I'm, I'm nominated in music. Surprise, surprise. Um, <laughs> and uh, uh, each of the candidates, um, then uh, we suggest an emerging artist um, that we would like to put forward as well. So uh, for me, this is Liam Ritz. He uh, was our composer fellow last season, our inaugural composer fellow, and has worked for, with the HPO for a long time. We've performed three of his works, actually. So it's the two of us up for this. And uh, we're just doing an interview about this tomorrow night because we won't be having a, a live ceremony. So um, that's a, a bit of a shame, but uh, they'll still, this will be, still be announced in uh, uh, Hamilton Arts Week, um, which is uh, the week of, I think, the 10th to the 15th, something like that. Um, and, uh, and Megan, uh, tell us about your nomination. So um, our former executive director, Diana Weir, uh, was nominated in the arts management category, and I'm the emerging arts management professional that is attached to her nomination, um, which is really exciting. I think she, Diana is pretty awesome and I, I really owe her a lot. She picked out my cover letter from a vast number of emails and I really appreciate her for it um, and provided a lot of really great guidance on getting this project started. So yeah, she's awesome. Great, yeah, and uh, yeah, we we owe a lot to Diana at the HPO. Um, she has left us for the Toronto Symphony Orchestra, but uh, I see she's been on this thread. She still keeps an eye on us and and is very dedicated to the orchestra. Uh, we showed her wearing the the wonderful HPO sweatshirt at the beginning of this uh, of this live stream. Um, so uh, just a couple more things here. Uh, we have some uh, enthusiastic comments here. Elaine, thank you for your enthusiastic presentation. Uh, Pat, loved revisiting the rich history of the HPO. And uh, Neil Spaulding, one of our staff members, uh, writes also that Liam was a member of the HPYO. That's, that's important to note. Um, and some uh, accolades, Megan, for you from Kim Varian, um, she, uh, executive director of the HPO. Uh, Megan, you're a natural storyteller and your passion for our history teaches us so much about what makes the HPO so special. Isn't that lovely? Well, on, on that note, um, we will say goodbye. Thank you, Megan, uh, for all of your research and your continued dedication to the HPO. It's so important for us to document this. Um, oh, here we have a, a picture up on the side of Diana wearing her favorite sweatshirt. <laughs> All right. Um, so uh, wonderful. Thank you very much for joining us, everybody. Uh, next week, it'll be same time, same place, Wednesday at noon on Facebook. And we will be talking to Mary J, who plays second trumpet with the HPO. And she will also be on with us with her husband, uh, Larry Larson, who is... Uh, also principal trumpet of the Kitchener-Waterloo Symphony and was also principal trumpet of the HPO. Uh, they'll be doing a fun quiz playing excerpts um, on the trumpet and we, <laughs> everybody listening, will have to guess or we'll just know what it is. So we have a little competition for you next week. So spread the word about that. <laughs> It'll be a lot of fun. Um, so thanks again, Megan, and thank you everyone for joining us and we will see you next week.